All right, so we're going to do a little bit of grade nine review about matter. So there's a handout that goes with this, but if you don't have the handout, you can print it off. It's fine. You can just draw it in your notebook. It's no, it's no big deal. You probably might even have it in your notebook from last year. So if we're looking at what matter is, matter is anything that has mass and takes up space or has volume. So anything that has mass and takes up space is considered to be matter. So energy would not be matter, but something like snow would be matter. And basically, if you look around, matter is anything that is around us. So everything you're looking at right now that your eyes are falling upon is matter or made up of matter. And basically, our matter exists as pure substances or mixtures. So if we take matter and we want to organize it, we can organize it all in a chart. So we've kind of simplified this chart here so that uh, <clears throat> when you're doing it, it won't be as complicated as we can make it. So starting up here at the top, we have matter that again has mass and takes up space. So let's divide it into our two categories here. We can divide it into pure substances and into mixtures. So let's go the way of the pure substances first. All right, so we've got pure substances here. And pure substances basically are made up of one type of element. So we've just got matter that is it's made up of one type of particle that's in there. All righty. So we can take our pure substance and divide it further into elements or compounds. Now, elements are going to be pieces of matter that are made up of something off of the periodic table. So just if it was something, the example I have down here is iron. Um, if we were talking about iron, if you could get a pure chunk of iron and you were able to cut it down into its individual little atoms, um, all those atoms would be iron atoms. Or if you had a chunk of pure gold, all those little gold atoms in there would be just gold atoms. So we've got our elements, which is made up of one type of particle from the periodic table and cannot be broken down into simpler substances. So if we broke down an element into simpler substances, we would actually be destroying the atoms in them. All right, so it's something like iron, iron metal. If you had a chunk of iron, all right, it's only made up of Fe or iron particles. Now we can also have compounds. Now, if you take your individual elements and you combine them together in fixed proportions, so for example, water always has two hydrogens and one oxygen, you can make compounds. It's still a pure substance. If you could get um, a cup of pure water, just pretend pure water came out of your tap. There was no uh, dissolved minerals in it. There was no carbon dioxide or oxygen or anything dissolved in that water. If you could just have H2O in that cup, that would be a pure substance made up of compounds. So compounds are composed of two or more elements in a fixed proportion. So that means, for example, water, again, is always H2O. If we change that formula at all, we end up with something different. So for example, if we have hydrogen peroxide, it would be H2O2. So that would be a completely different compound than H2O. All right, so we cannot, or that we can uh, separate them into simpler substances, but it's by chemical means, All right? So we can take our H2O, zap it with the electricity and end up with hydrogen on its own and oxygen on its own, All right? Not an easy process doesn't happen very simply, but it does happen. If you take your hydrogen peroxide and let it sit in the cupboard for years and years and years, you come back, you've, it's degraded down into water and oxygen. So, for example, table salt is made up of sodium and it's made of chlorine. There's always one sodium and one chlorine, and it's in a fixed proportion of one to one, and that's your table salt. And again, if you want to zap these two apart, you'd have to use a whole pile of the electricity to separate into pure sodium and pure chlorine, which, of course, are both very dangerous elements in pure form. <clears throat> now, over onto the other side, we've got our mixtures. And we could spend days and days and days on mixtures, but we're just going to simplify it and make it much, much, um, we're just going to simplify it. All right, so we've got mixtures, which consist of two or more pure substances that are mixed, obviously, together. And we can separate these by physical means. So I don't know, I don't remember um, what you guys, well, I don't know what you got to in grade nine, because some of you ended up um, doing school in school, some of you ended up doing school online, and who knows how far you got during chemistry. Um, but we could take a mixture of, let's say, water and sand and salt, and we can separate them. So we could filter out the sand, we could evaporate the water off and get our salt back again. So we can separate these things by physical means. Alrighty, so within our mixtures here, we've got a couple of things. We've got 
First one is a homogeneous mixture. So homogeneous, homo means the same, and genius means kind of looking uh, or where it comes from. So this is made up of something that looks like it's made up of all the same thing. All right, so if you were to look at something like Gatorade, um, you're looking at the Gatorade and you can't see the salts that are in there and the sugar that's in there and the water that's in there and the coloring that's in there. It's homogeneous. It looks like it's only made up of one type of product. All right, so it has a uniform composition throughout, which basically means it looks the same throughout. And we call it homogeneous. We can also call um, a homogeneous substance, a lot of times we call it a solution because it just looks like it's made up of one thing. We call something that's made up of one thing a solution. So if you were to take water and add salt to it and add sugar to it, mix it up really, really well, you probably would not know that there's salt and sugar in that water. And plus there's dissolved minerals, plus there's gases from uh, the water just being bubbled through your uh, plumbing system. So you end up with a glass of water that looks like it's only made of one thing, but there's a pile of stuff dissolved in there. All right, so the example we have here is apple juice. If you look at apple juice, all right, a lot of times it looks like it's made of only one substance, but there's fructose in there and there's other types of sugars in there, depending on what type of apple juice you buy. And there's flavorings in there and there's water in there. Now, the other kind of mixture that we can talk, the other classification that we're going to have here are called heterogeneous. Hetero means other. So this looks like it's made up of a bunch of other things. All right. So the composition is not uniform. So you can see all the different parts that are in there. And a lot of times we call these a mechanical mixture. So if you're having something like cookies, all right, so cookies, you can see the dough, you can see the chocolate chips, let's just say you have some sprinkles on there, whatever, you can see the different things that are in that type of um, mixture. If you took mud and sand and food coloring and you put it into uh, water, eventually some of those things are going to settle out and you can see the layer of mud and you can see the layer of sand and see the layer of water and that looks heterogeneous because it looks like it's made of more than one thing so our example here is we always use the example of pizza because pizza is yummy and you can see the things that are in pizza you can see the dough you can see the um the cheese you can see the pepperoni you can see the vegetables if you're a person who likes vegetables on their pizza so we would say pizza is a good example of a mechanical mixture Alrighty, so next slide. I hope you're taking notes while we're doing this as well. And remember, just stop it. If you're tired of hearing my voice, you can mute me for a little while and just write down what comes up as part of the notes. You can listen to it at your own time. You can listen to two slides, stop, go get a drink of water, come back. You can stop, go get a piece of pizza and come back. All right, it's way better than when you're in class. So if we look here, we can describe matter. If you remember back to grade nine, we can describe matter with their physical, and their chemical properties. So the physical properties are things like the state that it's in, liquid, solid, or gas, the color, the density. So is it heavier per unit space or lighter per unit space? Um, we can talk about the luster. So is it shiny or is it dull? You can talk about the clarity. Um, clarity is going to come up when we get to the, to the light, but is it transparent? Is it translucent or is it opaque? The hardness, can you scratch this thing really easily or the substance with your fingernail, or do you have to use something like a diamond to scratch it? Malleability, or if you remember, that means can you hammer it into a sheet? So something like aluminum foil can be hammered into a sheet. Um, another um, well, we, the opposite of that we would say is non-malleable. We can also talk about ductility. So can it be stretched into a wire? So something like copper or aluminum can be stretched into wires, which is really, really helpful, especially if you're electric trying to wire a house that you've got some copper wiring that you can use, right? You can be ductile or non-ductile. Non-ductile means you can't spread it or pull it into a wire. So there's a bunch of physical properties that we can use that we talked about. So the physical properties are sort of a way to describe the look, the feel, the texture of a substance. So these are all sorts of examples of physical properties. There's more as well. I just thought rather than going through them all a million times, we'll just, you can look them up yourself if you don't remember.
from grade nine. Just write, type in physical properties of matter into Google and all your answers will be there. So we can also describe matter using their chemical properties. And their chemical properties are things like, does that chemical react in water? So a lot of times you might put salt into water and nothing really happens. But if you put sodium on itself into water, if you guys remember from grade nine, if you did this in grade nine, if you didn't, when we come back, remind me and we'll do it. Um, if you put sodium in water, it totally reacts with water. Sodium will on its own will react with air, with oxygen. So that's how reactive it is. Um, will things react with acid? So you want to know the chemical properties of substances because it, it changes the way that you treat those substances. Alrighty. So oh, uh, the next example I do have down here is sodium. So let's use our example. Let's use sodium as our example. And again, remind me when we get back and we'll do a little demo of sodium in water. So if we take a look at sodium, so here's our hard sodium. Sodium is so, our hard sodium, our solid sodium. Sodium is so soft that you can actually cut it with a knife, all right? It's crazy. So if we're just looking at it here, some of the physical properties, well, we could say that it's shiny, so it's luster is shiny. Its color is silvery, or you can just describe it as gray. Now, sometimes what happens with um, sodium, because it reacts with air, you can see the other little chunk that they have here. Let me see if I get this little thing, this laser pointer to work. So if um, you can see it, it reacts with air, so it will get a dull sheen on the outside of it, like a dull covering on the outside. But basically, it is uh, silvery. It is less dense than water, so it actually will float on water. Um, it's soft, so like we said, it's not. Its hardness is that it's soft. Um, it's a solid in um, at room temperature. It's malleable, so you can actually like shape this into a sheet, or you can change the shape of it. Um, and if you were to look through it, it's opaque, right? So it doesn't allow light to flow through very easily or to move, through, transmit through very easily. If we look at its chemical properties, so here you can see it's floating on top of the water. All right, that's how it's actually reacting with water, which is kind of crazy when you think about water. Normally, like, you know, puts fires out. Here's something it'll it'll start a fire with. So it's chemical properties. It reacts with water. It reacts with oxygen. Like I said, it gets that film around the outside of it. And it also reacts with acid. So this is its reaction in water. Imagine its reaction in acid. I don't even want to think about it. Okay, so that's how we can describe matter if you remember back from grade nine. Another thing we t talked about in grade nine is a physical change versus a chemical change. So um, some of you may spend, have spent some time on this, some of you may not have spent some time on this. So what we're looking for um, for physical versus chemical changes is well, what we're going to be doing in grade 10 is everything we basically are talking about is getting up to how do chemical changes happen, what happens during a chemical change. So that's why we're reviewing it and going in this direction. So a physical change basically is the example we always give is ripping paper. So if you rip paper up, no matter how small you rip the pieces or cut the pieces up to, the physical properties of the paper itself are still exactly the same. It may be in a different form, so rather than being a sheet, it's in a bunch of teared up little pieces, but it's basically the same um, substance. Same with, we often use the example of an ice cube melting into water. It's still water, it's just in a different form. So it's a change that involves the form of matter, but not the chemical composition. So if I was looking at paper, if I could look at paper under a microscope and see the atoms that are making up paper, it would still be long chains of carbons that are all linked up with hydrogens and oxygens. All right, so it's not going to change at all. all right, so ripping paper is always our example of a physical change. However, our chemical changes... All right. In this particular case here, what happens in our, our chemical change is the atoms that make up the substance, they break bonds with each other and they rearrange with other atoms. So you end up with a totally different substance. So we're rearranging the atoms of one or more substances. So they're breaking apart and they're rearranging themselves. And this is what we're going to get to when we get to do the different types of chemical reactions. Which again, if you're taking grade 11 um, chemistry and beyond, you're going to be using this chemistry for literally the rest of your life. All right. Even if you're not going into chemistry for the rest of your life, this is still going to come up in the rest of your life. You may not just say to yourself, oh, this is a chemical change, but it will be. Okay, so it changes both the physical and the chemical properties. So when you're looking at, because we've, we've produced a new substance, which is going to have different physical and chemical properties. All right, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to form at least one new substance. 
So the next slide shows you some of the um, evidence of a chemical change. So if you have a chemical change, the first thing you will notice, and if you remember back to grade nine, if we were in class, I'd be asking you guys these things, but we're not. So I'm just going to tell you everything. Um, you would get, or let's just use this example. I always use this example. So if you took a blue liquid and a red liquid and mix them together, you would expect to get a purple liquid that comes out at the end. But if you mixed a blue liquid and a red liquid and it came out with a yellow, that would be an unexpected color change. So if you get an unexpected color change or a change that's not due to blending. So if like if you took blue and white, put them together and got light blue, that's blending. But if you took blue and white and put them together and got red, that is an unexpected color change not due to blending. So if you get an unexpected color change, so unexpected is a huge part there because you can get a color change, but that doesn't mean that there's a chemical reaction unless it's something that's completely unexpected right you're going to get a lot of heat released or absorbed um, if we I hope we have time if you didn't do this in grade 9 I have a little I have a whole little series of labs and one of them is um, where you can compare heat being released with heat being absorbed so let's hope we have time to do that and if you if I tend to forget just remind me again right if we get the formation of a precipitate so if you have two clear substances they could be clear and colorless they could be clear with a blue color and you mix the two things together and you end up with say like a, a, a gray chunky thing at the bottom that's the formation of a precipitate that solid that you formed as a precipitate that's evidence of a chemical change and lastly if you have gas bubbles produced so all of a sudden you've got gas bubbles produced in something and you've got um, gases being released you know that you've got a chemical change there all right, so chemical changes happen everywhere. So again, we could spend days going through lists of chemical changes, but I've just got a few of them down here to remind you in grade nine. So everywhere there are chemical changes. That's why I'm saying like the rest of your life, you're going to be experiencing chemical, you've already been experiencing chemical changes since you were, before you were born, but um, you're going to experience them the rest of your life. You just may not be saying, oh, this is a chemical change. So when you're cooking, when your food is digesting, digesting every time you inhale oxygen and your cells burn your cells, your cells burn that oxygen for energy. Every time you're doing respiration, you're going to be experiencing those chemical reactions. Photosynthesis. So when our plants take the carbon dioxide in the water and change that into oxygen, which we breathe for respiration, or the glucose, which we eat for respiration, you are experiencing a chemical change. All right, all your mining processes that they use to form metals for your phones or for your cars or anything that's made out of metal or anything that um, uses metal as part of the processing okay is going to be chemical changes uh, transportation just look at all the gas that's burned in transportation purposes tons of um, chemical reactions happening here oh, simply in the lab when we're doing our little lab experiments obviously I'm going to be giving you things a lot of them are going to be chemical reactions right so etc 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 so since we're talking about chemical reactions and since we're going to be getting to chemical reactions, let's look at the parts of the chemical reaction. Again, hopefully just a uh, review of grade nine. So we'll, go th we'll get through this fairly quickly. So let's look at the parts of the chemical reaction. We, I'm going to use the example of photosynthesis just because I just talked about it. So for photosynthesis, you're going to have carbon dioxide plus water. The sun is going to be the energy that's going into the process. It's going to be the energy that's being used to get this process going. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be producing um, oxygen and glucose. So we're taking carbon dioxide and water and we're producing oxygen and glucose. That's a chemical reaction there, right? So the the um, elements or the compounds or elements that are on um, the left side of the this part this side of the um, equation are known as the reactants so the reactants are the substances that go into a chemical reaction they're like your ingredients if you're baking or cooking these are all your ingredients that are going into the chemical reaction all right so they're going to the substances that are the substances that are going into the reaction the things on the right hand side so the elements or compounds on the right hand side 
Oh, shoot. Forgot about this part. I thought I put this at the end. But anyway, this arrow, it's always, 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 always an arrow. Always, 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 always an arrow. Never an equal sign. Always an arrow. So a chemical reaction has an arrow in there because this is showing you that you take these two things and you are going to yield or you're going to form or you're going to produce these things here. Okay. So those arrows, if if you see in a word equation, it says yields or produces or forms or produces or, or I said that already, or makes this means that's what the, that arrow means all right so it's always got to be an arrow there's always somebody who puts an equal sign but I'm thinking if I really stress it maybe this will be the one time in history that kids don't put an equal sign down okay so what we're going to yield or produce or form or make is glucose and oxygen Alrighty, and these are going to be known as the products. So if you're baking this, the products would be your cupcakes or your bread or your meatloaf or whatever that you're making at the end. Okay, so these are the substances that are made during the reaction or made by the reaction. Alrighty, we're almost at the end here. So <coughs> coming up next, so we're at the end of this kind of review. Coming up next, we're going to be reviewing the periodic table. So if you've got a periodic table that's kicking around in your notes from last year or whatever, pull that out. I'll, I'll post one as well. Or you can look at one online. You can put some periodic tables. If you've got a phone, you can put a periodic table onto your phone. Just don't pay for a periodic table app. There's enough free ones out there that you can just put a periodic table, a free thing on there. Um, we don't need to know the periodic table in that much detail that you need to pay for anything. Um, and we're going to talk about the parts of the atom. So if you remember from last year, we did all the parts of the atom. For those of you who maybe did online learning, you're going to be learning about the parts of the atom. So that is this um, little review finished for now. See you next time. Look at my cute little PowerPoint happening there. Alrighty, that's enough.